This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by TopTal. TopTal is addressing the talent shortage in the blockchain space, connecting companies of all sizes with the world's best blockchain engineers. If you're looking to scale your team, check out toptal.com slash epicenter. And by DutchX, the fair and secure decentralized exchange platform by Gnosis. To learn how you can build dApps which leverage DutchX's liquidity pool, visit epicenter.tv slash DutchX. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, a cryptocurrency podcast that interviews academics, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders in the cryptocurrency and blockchain technology spaces. I'm Meher Roy, and today I'm really pleased to have a new host join me in this interview. That host is Friederike Ernst. Friederike, welcome to the Epicenter team. Hi, good to be here. So uh, tell us a bit about your background, Friederike, and and how you started in the blockchain space. Oh yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, so I'm actually a physicist by training. Uh, so I studied physics and then uh, did a PhD on low dimensional complex quantum systems. Um, and I quite enjoyed science. So I stayed in science for a little bit longer after that. I um, did a postdoc at Columbia University um, and then a second one at Stanford and Slack. Um, but all the while uh, I had actually become pretty interested in the blockchain space. So I heard about Bitcoin for the first time um, over five years ago, 2013. Um, and uh, d- at first I thought, oh, oh this is, uh, this is uh, a load of uh, whatever. <laughs> um, but it, it was, it was uh, enough to actually get me interested. Um, and I started thinking about uh, what money is and uh, what, uh, um, what actually makes money valuable um, and the social contracts that actually underlie all of that. Um, and um, at a se- similar time, uh, two friends of mine started um, Gnosis. Uh, so I, I was actually close to uh, Gnosis from the start. Um, and after my time at Stanford, decided to join them full time. Uh, so I became the COO. This was uh, still before the token sale, so early last year. Uh, and I've been in the blockchain space full time ever since uh, and have never looked back. Wow, that must be quite a switch from low dimensional quantum physics to cryptocurrency. Yes and no. So I, I was an experimental physicist. I always really enjoyed building things. Um, and blockchain um, is, I mean, it's a completely different subject matter, but um, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of the things that you do on a daily basis, you question hypotheses, you build test systems, um, you think about what could possibly go wrong. Um, and that's that's actually very similar uh, as in physics. So, Friederike, tell us about some of your interests in the cryptocurrency space and what kind of episodes could the listeners look forward to from you? Oh, I, um, I am super interested in business models uh, that weren't possible beforehand. So basically um, capturing unused potentials in a way uh, by actually making things uh, peer to peer. Uh, That's one of the things. I also love governance um, and governance mechanisms. And um, I think governance, you you, you notice, I notice that it often goes wrong um, in politics, for instance. Um, But then when you actually sit down and think about what could be done better, it's actually pretty hard to come up with a decent system. Um, so in hindsight, I actually have to apologize in my head to a lot of people that I, I didn't really say any of those things, but I thought uh, uh, this is a system that was de- devised in a weird way. And um, uh, actually thinking about these things, uh, I find really pleasurable and uh, de- and uh, asking myself, um, how would I design this if if uh, if I had to design design this? And kind of blockchain gives you um, a platform uh, for doing this. Um, I also really like deep tech, so uh, things like uh, scalability and uh, the sort of uh, low level language that you use for uh, building stuff. Um, yeah, so I, I I I'm interested in just the actual building blocks and how they all fit together as, as well. Cool. So, so we, I mean, I, I'm really looking forward to recording quite a few episodes with you, Friederike. For our listeners, uh, please do drop Friederike a note as an iTunes review 
or to one of our email addresses uh, so feedback is would be really good to get her started on her epicenter journey thank you so today we are talking to jake brookman and alexander bulkin from coinfund coinfund is one of the earliest crypto funds to have uh, begun business and it's been one of the is therefore it's one of the oldest crypto funds so we are pleased to have jake and alex on the show jake welcome thank you meher uh, pleasure to be here thank you meher cool so uh, so jake of course we've known each other for for a while now we met at last devcon and i'm i'm familiar with your story it's a very interesting story so for our listeners tell us about how you came into the blockchain ecosystem and why did you start this fund awesome thank you um you know i'm a i'm a technologist i worked on on wall street um in kind of the hedge fund world for for a long time um i i'm the kind of person that is an early adopter of technology uh, i got my first bitcoin sent to me by a friend of mine in 2011 um and I, at that point i i don't think i fully understood what it was but i definitely started paying attention um and then around mid 2013 i uh bought some bitcoin on coinbase in order to just make a random investment and hold it and see what happened and that's what really got me engaged um in the space uh and then you know it wasn't really until the ethereum white paper came out and i started i read that and i started to think about what does it mean to have a world of uh many different kinds of digital assets uh and i you know along with alex uh, kind of said hey maybe we should uh create a portfolio that diversifies uh the risk across all of these different kinds of assets that are, assets that are likely to appear um <clears throat> given the advent of a platform uh, like ethereum and so that became uh you know basically the basis for coin fund and you know we launched this kind of a proof of concept fund in in 2015 fantastic um so you worked at triton research uh prior to that right yeah so my career is basically you know kind of in the hedge fund world uh, for about 5 years and I was a technical product manager and engineer at uh, amazon.com working on uh, ad tech products for about 2 years and then uh, as a CTO of Triton Research which is a company that uh, did a lot of interesting uh, financial modeling and private technology companies cool fantastic um alex so uh, how did you get uh, get into the blockchain ecosystem and uh, what made you want to start a fund um yeah so i blame jake who you know started telling me about crypto in 2015 and then eventually showed me a couple of at that time they were extremely new and advanced ideas such as you know ethereum and augur and when i combined together ethereum and augur in my mind i kind of saw just how powerful this technology was to um you know to be able to um enhance real life interactions between people and provide alternative finance uh technology and so i got completely bought in um it that came on the heels of me also studying some amount of <coughs> some amount of um organizational and social psychology which made it extremely interesting for me to think about consensus in both technology space and the human space and how they kind of flow into each other so i joined jake in early 2016 and eventually we left golden to the coin fund full time cool so as i understand it like jake and and alexander you founded coin fund with uh, with another co-founder and then like other people joined on board from the community coin fund created right Well, we started. Uh, th- there was us and and a couple more people who are, who were and still are slightly, uh, you know, passive. They were just curious. But then um, Jake was the first to start uh, and launch um, the Coin Fund Slack, which I think, by the way, uh, you know, Jake is the, the the best community manager I've ever known, and and is extremely um, insightful in creating sort of community spaces. which i think is still our strongest point of coin fund but uh coin fund slack very quickly became a source of information uh ideas people you know um allies um arguments and so on and so forth 
So our current uh, partner, Alex Felix, came uh, as a Slack member and, and many other people we worked with down the road. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I personally appreciate Jake's, you know, community management. In fact, I, I have to admit that while preparing for many of the episodes at Epicenter, I have listened to Jake's podcast because like he had the guest first. So I listened to that podcast and then like my epicenter questions were like, uh, you know, like variations on Jake's questions or questions that I think Jake did not cover. So, you know, like actually like, thank you, Jake, for your, you know, like almost invisible contributions to epicenter. <laughs> well, thank you very much. That's uh, it's very nice of you, Meher. But, um, you know, I think overall, like if you if you kind of go on the coin fund Twitter account, it says, you know, the best way to invest in a, in a uh, community is to be a part of it. Uh, and that was sort of a little tagline that we had from very early in the game, uh, where we really, you know, figured that like in this very early space where it was really quite small still in 2016, um, you know, and especially in the space where you're making investments and in teams, uh, one of the most important things is to engage the communities. And from the from the decentralization standpoint, a lot of these projects are creating open decentralized networks, and those networks depend on you know, their constituents, their participants, the governance of those networks. I mean, so as, as, a, as an organization, we've always like been very community oriented. We, um, you know, we, for example, throw regular quarterly happy hours here in New York, um, kind of get some face time with our, with our community. Uh, we try to participate in our community events. Um, and also as investors, we try to participate in the networks uh, of the, of the uh, projects that we, um, that we hold in our portfolio. And that was, by the way, uh, one of the uh, things that drew me to CoinFund in, in, in the beginning is, is how easy it was to reach to uh, all these teams doing these projects and ask them questions and pick their brains, which is something we still do uh, and, and with not a small amount of pleasure. Cool. I think we've segued right into the CoinFund discussion. So what, what would you say um, makes a crypto fund a crypto fund and would you mind uh, disclosing um how what uh, assets and what amount you have under management currently uh i we would mind disclosing that but <laughs> <laughs> but i'm happy to talk about um i'm happy to talk about crypto funds and you know ultimately from the very beginning i thought that um a crypto fund is kind of a, a slightly different structure so you know, I think what we have seen happen over the last couple of years in blockchain, um, and, and I think most people in blockchain would agree, is that there's a there's a new asset class here. This is the the digital asset class, and whenever you have a new asset class, presumably it has different properties, and when it has different properties, presumably the structure um, of an investor or of a fund that's participating in that asset class should be um, kind of commensurate with with the asset class. So there's a few things that set it apart, right? For example, you know, liquidity, like you can invest in early stage projects, as we've seen many people do in 2017, um, and you get liquidity much faster using blockchain technology than you would in private equity, um, you know, or other forms of investments. And, you know, a lot of people, when they, when they kind of come into the crypto fund space, they try to put a box around crypto. They say, you know, we're going to do a VC fund in crypto, or we're going to do a hedge fund in crypto, or we're going to do a fund of funds in crypto. Um, but ultimately, like we have always thought that um, you have to create a structure that conforms to the asset class and takes advantage of the features of the asset class that you're uh, that you're investing in. And so we've spent um, a lot of time uh, thinking about what that structure is. Um, and you know, in short, a crypto fund, I think, is it's a little bit of a of a hybrid, right, between a VC fund in the sense that you're always, you know, at this stage of the game, you're you're working with early stage teams. You're really trying to push those projects for get them to production, and it's very much a, a venture capital vocation. But at the same time, you're then dealing with assets that are liquid that trade on twenty four hour markets, and that's very much a, a hedge fund vocation. So at a high level, I think a, a crypto fund is. Um, is sort of a hybrid structure between those two, um, and it keeps developing, right? So now, uh, you know, as we as we talk about kind of staking and validation, I think the role of crypto of crypto funds begins to change uh, even more. And and just to add to that, I think 
if you um, want to do a good job uh, in, in crypto investing, it, it requires you to um, be a professional synthesizer in a space where past experience doesn't necessarily in, in, inform uh, future, be, future experience because this space uh, gets re, reinvented every six months or so. And so, uh, you know, you asked me initially, why do I call myself chief alchemist? That's part of it. It's like, how do you look back and then project um, a, a picture into the future, which is, you know, a good picture, which is not going to be outdated by the new ideas, which does not prevent you from um, taking new directions. As a crypto fund, you always have to be ready to go into a new direction, such as, for example, we're going to talk about generalized mining. That was a direction that became obvious uh, to us early, but 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 not you know last year. It came this year, and so you have to adjust and you have to be structurally fluid, and you have to be fluid in your thinking. You can't just decide, oh, it's all protocols, because that's actually that actually changes. Have you ever considered that one of the biggest factors holding back growth in the blockchain industry is the lack of talented available developers? By some estimates, there are up to 14 job openings for every single blockchain developer in the world. That's where TopTal comes in. TopTal is a global network of talent in business, technology, and design, and they pick their members by selecting only the top 3% of applicants. When you work with TopTal, you're getting the creme de la creme. They've got a blockchain specialization that's an on-demand service that connects your business to an elite network of developers and engineers specializing in areas like Solidity, Smart Contracts, Hyperledger Fabric, R3 Corda, Decentralized Applications, and more. What's best about TopTal, what I like the most about this service, is they take the stress and pain out of hiring. Who has time to publish job openings and sift through resumes and schedule interviews and all that stuff? It's a white glove service, so they take care of everything. And a TopTal Director of Engineering will deliver the best candidates for your position on a silver platter in as fast as 24 hours. And from there, your company can work with your new hire for a no-risk trial period and you pay only if you're satisfied. So simplify your hiring process and access the world's best blockchain talent. For a limited time, Epicenter listeners are eligible for a $1,000 credit after the first $2,000 paid towards their first hire. To learn more, go to toptal.com slash epicenter. And we'd like to thank TopTal for their support. You're fairly flexible as to what to invest into. So how, how do you pick uh, projects to invest into? Um, yeah, so, so on, that, on that point, just like the core principle of CoinFund is that we're looking at a technology space that's, first of all, very nascent and constantly, um, constantly changing, right? So, you know, to, to paint a quick story, in 2015, you know, VCs saw teams building decentralized networks and they said, we want to invest in that. So they invested in the equity of the teams, but then the value accrued to the tokens, right? And that's kind of the high level of like the FAT protocol thesis. Um, but then, you know, the technology shifted Again, and now we have all these layer two projects, but layer two projects, um, only a, a tiny minority of them actually have token models today. And very, very few of them have equity that gives you exposure directly to those projects. In fact, about half of them are, are open source projects. And the way that founders tend to monetize that is by building apps on top. So if you're a VC, you know, you're suddenly you're in a position where like, oh, I thought I was investing in tokens, but now the, the landscape has changed again. And how do I find exposure to layer two? So one of the foundational principles of, uh, you know, kind of how we think about structuring exposure to projects is we say, we want to be maximally flexible in how we can structure exposure. So that means if the appropriate mechanism is, is very traditional private equity, you know, we'll do that. And an example of an investment that we've made out of CoinFund is, for example, CoinList, right? A very, very traditional equity investment. But all the way on the other end of the spectrum, you know, we might be investing in a, in a decentralized network directly. And that might mean, you know, buying tokens on, on liquid markets. And then somewhere in between, it might mean buying a SAFT or buying a convertible note or buying equity that may convert to tokens in the future. Um, so, so that's the first thing to say about kind of like how, how we structure investments. Um, what we invest into uh, generally falls into two categories. We, we kind of consider ourselves, first of all, full stack investors. It means we don't just invest in protocol. We don't just invest in middleware. We don't just invest in apps. We try to find the best opportunities in the iterating cycles of, of how these technologies uh, develop. And we think that um, 
you know, for example, applications that have hundreds of millions of users that could put blockchain in front of their user bases are still very, very compelling uh, in the same way that protocols are compelling uh, in their kind of adoption uh, case. Uh, but we're also uh, not, you know, we're also kind of practical, right? We say like in order for the Web3 or, you know, decentral decentralized world vision to take place, um, money has to move from traditional markets Founders have to have um, financial services. There needs to be compliance clarity. Everyone needs to be able to operate and kind of experiment with these different projects. And for that reason, we'll invest in uh, what we call key financial infrastructure. So these are things like issuance platforms. These might be things like secondary, um, uh, se secondary trading uh, exchanges. It might be uh, banking and financial services for startups. Um, and in that way, we're, we're a very like general uh, investor. Our team is general and multidisciplinary, and we can apply kind of our knowledge and expertise in blockchain to select um, what we think are, are compelling projects in both of those areas. Cool, that's super interesting. Um, so once you've selected a project, um, what kind of support uh, do you offer them? And uh, how actively are you actually uh, involved in governance and staking, for instance? So, Alex, do you want to take this? Because Alex has worked uh, very closely with many different projects. Um, uh, also, he's, for example, the, the author of the, um, the stablecoin model at Sweetbridge. Uh, I am the author of the credit risk model for Etherisk, right? And so these are examples of how we deeply work with projects. Yeah, so, so we, um, we really try to uh, be as useful as we can. And... <clears throat> I think over time we've uh, helped projects on many levels, you know, um, understanding the economics and, and kind of product market fit uh, in crypto was one of the big value that we uh, provided to um, non-crypto native companies that were coming into crypto um, and, and trying to make use of these uh, innovative models to operate. Um, you know, it starts from... The very first conversation we have with the team, even before we invest, you know, all the questions we ask the team are the questions that everybody should be asking that team. So, you know, one of the biggest questions we always ask projects is like, why blockchain? You know, is that just a publicity stunt or does it actually make sense? And, and, and on, that, uh, on that trajectory, we always inevitably come to a place where we look for the right um, integration and balance um, between centralization, decentralization, user experience, and uh, crypto economics, and so on. Um, you know, we've helped projects um, build out their um, kind of investment structures, um, first and foremost for our own benefit, but then, of course, uh, you know, that then later helps them go to other investors. Um, we uh, we have advised uh, projects what sort of help they may need, who they should be working with, uh, you know, in this space, um, and who they who they should be uh, hiring. We've interviewed people on their behalf, so it's a very broad um, it's a very broad space of uh, value add that we provide. And I, and I think now that's, that's shifting uh, and continuing to progress, and this kind of ties into, Frederica, uh, your comment about staking. So as the market kind of of decentralized networks develop, develops, um, what we're starting to see is more and more um, diverse and domain-specific networks. So in the beginning, you know, you had cryptocurrencies. You maybe had some asset issuance platforms like Counterparty or BitShares. Then Ethereum comes along and they're like, no, nope, this is, here you go. This is a general smart uh, contract platform. Um, and those very low level technologies, that's what we kind of thought of as decentralized networks. But we live a little bit more and the co technology continues to develop. Um, and now we see uh, resource networks. These are networks uh, like Filecoin, which give you decentralized storage. These are computational networks. Um, you know, like Golem, for example, where you can render video. These are, these are networks like LivePeer, where you can transcode and, and stream live video. Um, you see 
social media kind of content networks and decentralized Twitters and decentralized Wikipedias. And what you start to you know, anticipate is a world where um, these networks are ubiquitous, they're glo uh, globally accessible, um, and in some cases, they might even grow potentially, might grow larger than their kind of centralized counterparts, especially if you think about like decentralized storage space, right? Like ultimately, there's more storage in the world uh, across people's devices than probably Google and Amazon put together. Um, and so in, in that world um, of decentralized networks, every different kind of network has to engage third parties to perform services for that network. In the beginning, it was miners who were processing transactions on, on Bitcoin. Then uh, you know, we went kind of to proof of stake systems and then we had validators and delegators. Um, and now if we go kind of case by case, what we realize is the number of participants in these networks is growing. Um, I was just at the Polkadot meetup last night here in, in New York and uh, in the Polkadot system, they have, a, they have a participant type of network called Fisherman. And what fishermen do is they go into, uh, you know, they, they, they basically submit proofs of wrongdoing about uh, what people are doing on the network to ensure kind of the security of that network. And so in a world where all these different uh, kinds of participants are providing services, it's sort of natural for a, a fund to say, you know, hey, I might have access to this network because I'm an early investor here. Or this is um, a project that is in my portfolio, and by engaging their network directly, I can add very measurable, very um, obvious benefit to the network. Like think about if you're um, if you're in layer two, um, a lot of the success of uh, kind of state channel payment networks depends on well, how much liquidity can I have in the hubs, um, you know, of of the payment network. And if you're a fund and you and you can kind of make an investment where where you're providing liquidity, then that's great for your network, right? Because then you increase the network's throughput. So there's some examples of how uh, of how can, uh, funds can participate. This almost starts to touch into uh, this topic that you call generalist generalized mining, Jake. Um, we'll we'll I think we'll we'll get to that theme later on. But and and like your thoughts on generalized mining, but it's super interesting that. Um, like with the times like coin fund as a fund has kept changing right like it started out doing doing liquid investments then it went into like saft like illiquid things and now it's also like building validators and like some of these service providers for these for the for the, for these networks another key idea behind coin fund is uh, was expressed in one of your blogs in which which was titled like fat protocols are not an investment thesis right in which you talk about like you know coin funds approach to investing but you also like sort of not admonish but talk about some of the downsides of adopting this fat protocol investing investing approach in the blockchain space so i'm actually like curious about about your thoughts there so could you tell us what this fat protocol investing approach is first absolutely uh, so Fat Protocols is a famous post um, created by Joel Monegro, who's now a partner placeholder uh, VC. And, um, you know, it's sort of uh, describing the, the view cultivated at Union Square Ventures. And, and, and it's actually like a really important piece in the sense that it, it, it tells uh, the reality of decentralized networks. And that reality is um, overall at a very high level, very generally, uh, val value of decentralized networks will tend to pool in their digital assets rather than in the equity of the team that created the network. And this is like a key early insight into how investors should be structuring exposure to blockchain projects. And so in that sense, it's very important. But, but the other thing about the FAT protocols post is that, you know, it's, it's one of the earliest attempts uh, to kind of make sense of these things. And it's also not very precise. And I think a lot of people um, who, who were coming into the, the blockchain space as investors, they needed to um, anchor themselves in the space somehow. And, and FAT protocols seemed like a really kind of very compelling uh, narrative just to say, OK, look, just like another technology investing um, in, a, in a new space, I'm going to go and basically like invest in the infrastructure of that space rather than the apps. And 
you know, in the case of blockchain, those are called protocols. And here's why. Um, it's because the, the value, you know, will accrue there. Now, what happens when you start actually spending time with protocols and applications um, and basically the, the decentralization stack is that you realize like there's no really like clear distinction between like what is a protocol, what is an app? It's sort of like, you know, is the Twitter is Twitter an app or is it a protocol? Well, in fact, kind of the Twitter front end is an app on an API that exists. And that API is kind of like the Twitter protocol, right? And then people build other apps other than Twitter on top of it. Um, or if you look at Augur, well, Augur is an app, right? It's a prediction market platform. But what it really is is a protocol because someone can come in, they can build another front end on Augur. Um, they can build uh, some kind of other protocol or application on top. And so you, you begin to like realize that you know, the distinction between app and protocol is not quite clear cut. I mean, there's certainly things that are like, you know, like lower level in the stack and things that are higher level in the stack and things that are more user facing and things that are more developer facing. But ultimately, in order to understand where value accrues, you kind of have to understand how that individual protocol works. And then my post, Fat Protocols Are Not an Investment Thesis, is, is just trying to point out that, um, you know, very simply that like, if you for example, if you're investing in Ether because you think some applications are going to take off on Ethereum and thus appreciate Ether price, you might not actually be uh, making the correct investment. Because in order to determine whether the value of application usage flows to Ether price, you really just have to examine that particular application or that particular protocol like in its own right. And all that post is saying is that like you... <laughs> You know, you need facts and circumstances, and sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. But if you don't understand the crypto economics, you can't really, like, make the decision of uh, whether this is the appropriate value accrual that you're investing in. Super interesting. So the way I've kind of thought about, like, when I read your blog, the imagination I got was, so if you look at, like, the, the internet, um, like, so you have you have all of these protocols TCP, IP, then TCP, HTTP, then you have like TLS. And let's say like you were a VC, uh, let's say you were I don't know, I don't know Adam, Adam Draper's grandfather or somebody like that, and you had a chance to like you 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 were a VC through the 80s and the 90s. Maybe you were like Tim Draper or Tim Draper's father. And and if you think of a career like that. That career is is pretty interesting because like I'm sure they had the opportunity to invest in some team that was like I don't know maybe Tim Berners Lee's team building HTTP, uh, but and they ha did have the chance to also invest in a team like Google that was using HTTP to build a search application. The difference is Tim Berners Lee probably made like twenty or fifty million, whereas Larry Page. Uh, made 50 billion right so that's like a i don't know almost like a probably a thousand fold difference in the outcomes whereas like you can it would be hard to argue that like tim berners lee's contribution was smaller than larry pages like i would say like technologically both are e like equally valuable but the financial outcomes for both of these things are so radically different right so like when when you do that kind of when you see that kind of vc journey you start to empathize with the VC class in in always thinking about where value accrues on this stack, right? So I think if if somebody's a VC, their fundamental question is, okay, cryptocurrency is coming, blockchains are coming, and they'll power all of these applications. But and there will be many good technologies invented. But it's not necessary that every good technology will make people rich. So they want to invest specifically in those things that are going to make people rich because investing in those things is, is what is going to make them rich. Uh, and so, and so like this fat protocol thesis argues that like it's the base layer protocols that like Bitcoin and Ethereum that are going to make you rich invest there. Whereas like your approach is don't be so hasty about that judgment. It, re, it sort of, depends on the particular application we are talking about. Would it be correct to say that 
in in your idea it there might be cases in which a wallet makes most of the money or like some some ui facing element makes all of the money and the protocol layer and even like the application logic doesn't make any do you think a scenario like that could happen absolutely i i do think let me give you like two quick examples to maybe illustrate right so so let's say like you want to capture the value of an app on ethereum like augur right you kind of have two choices like right? you can go into into augur rep tokens if you feel that rep will reflect the value you could also try to go into ether because you're saying you know ether uh, as the base layer technology will accrue the value of augur um what is the value of augur well a lot of traders you know they make trades on the platform and all these prediction markets and then the platform you know on a market basis kind of takes fees and then it pays some of those fees to uh the the resolvers of markets which are rep holders right um and so you have this concept of like turnover so now it's it's fairly easy to see that you know if you're an ether then you're what you're doing is you're capturing kind of the the utilization of the Augur protocol or the Augur app, you're not so much capturing the turnover. In order to capture the turnover, you actually have to hold the rep, right? And this is because, you know, um, when Augur transactions go on chain, they're sort of, you know, the, the theory would be, okay, a lot of people want to use Augur. People are then buying, uh, by, buying Ether in order to utilize the Augur protocol. But then what you're capturing is the value of, the utilization of Augur, but not the tr transaction volume of Augur, right? So for that, you probably want to hold rep in that case. I'll give you a, I'll give you an example from the totally opposite end of the spectrum. Let's say that you're a centralized company, and uh, you have a user base of a hundred million users. But what you, what you're taking on is a blockchain strategy where you can actually put, you know, some kind of crypto or or blockchain features in front of this existing audience. Well, who's more likely to convert, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of users into crypto? A protocol that has been built, you know, with no obvious utilized applications or an existing company with a track record um, of, of, of uh, converting users and that already has like a measure of, of user trust and market fit. Um, well, I would argue Maybe they both have a shot, but but it's you know but the application case is still is still pretty compelling, um, and so that's why I think you know as an investor, um, and especially now that that we're a couple of years into like smart contract platforms and DApps, um, there are definitely compelling opportunities where some companies will be able to put applications in front of uh, kind of mainstream users and capture value that way, and there are compelling opportunities where someone might you know, create a protocol that, that everybody adopts and, and captures the value. You know, the Dutch have given us so much. Orange carrots, Bluetooth, artificial hearts, even donuts were invented by Dutch people. But they also gave us Dutch auctions, which as it turns out, are great for decentralized exchanges. Dutch X is a decentralized trading protocol for ERC-20 tokens, and it's invented, designed, and built by Gnosis. Current order book based exchanges, whether centralized or decentralized, have a couple of issues. Miners and exchanges can front run a trade when they step in front of a large order to gain an economic advantage. Not to mention issues with securing funds, high listing fees, lack of liquidity and pricing efficiencies. The Dutch X exchange platform uses a Dutch auction mechanism to determine the fair value for a token. And participants in a trade are encouraged to reveal their true willingness to pay, which eliminates front running. As a permissionless on-chain protocol, it's useful for bots and other smart contracts needing to exchange tokens. And DutchX also acts as an oracle for dApps requiring a price feed. So to learn more, check out the documentation at epicenter.tv slash DutchX. Smart contracts are live on the Ethereum mainnet, so you can start building today. We'd like to thank Gnosis and DutchX for their support of Epicenter. I also personally feel like the question of value capture can be very complex, right? Like, so you mentioned like the example of Augur. Now, if I look at something like decentralized exchanges, that's an even more complicated question. Cause like when you see like a protocol like zero X, so you have Ethereum, which is the base protocol. Then you have zero X, which is like this decentralized exchange protocol. Then you have these order books, right? So centralized companies can build like order books that run on zero X. 
and then then you have this ui or wallet layer where ultimately the user they want they want to trade ethereum for maker they are in a wallet and they click a button and then that wallet is going to decide whether to use the which order book which protocol 0x or a competitor on which platform right so you have these like four different parts of the stack and it's entirely unclear which one is the one that's going to make the most money right so uh of course like all transactions will go through ethereum but like ethereum just gets some transaction fee per order is that going to be the biggest amount or 0x which is like a governance token is governance going to get like the most of the value capture or does the order book get a lot of the money because the, it traps liquidity or whether in the end it's the wallet that makes the money because like if you if you see the best hardware wallet is ledger right so if there's lots of decentralized exchanges happening the way ledger the hardware wallet maker structures their integrations with decentralized exchanges are going to determine what what play, what players win at the order book and exchange level and therefore they'll extract their own commission to root users to these order books so ledger can also make money on uh, on this stack and so like it's it's a highly complex question on like which which part accrues value isn't it absolutely it is and you know and, and again in in that example right um if you're let's say if you've transacted 100,000 um orders on on 0x protocol right you could have transacted a million dollars or you could have transacted 100 million dollars and it's sort of like the the actual turnover or 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 mag order of magnitude of uh of the throughput of that system is not necessarily like off reflected on chain it's more like a uh like a projection of the utilization of that protocol on the chain right and so in that case you know should you be holding ether should you be holding the 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 zero x token um well zero x token is interesting in its own right right because you mentioned that it's a it's a governance token and i think it's still you know we're still learning about governance tokens and exactly how do they uh, you know how, how do they value the ability to upgrade protocols and things like that but it's certainly um kind of a compelling case to say you know if a lot of people are using that protocol and they kind of rely on that protocol for their business or whatever activities they're engaged in um then they would want a stake in the governance they wouldn't want that protocol to like get away from them uh in some way right and present risk to their businesses so so maybe that is a compelling way to to value tokens that way cool so i think uh, we are we are already moving in that direction um in the past uh, d- 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 recently you uh, you two alex and uh, jake have started speaking about generalized mining um would you be able to uh, explain to us uh, what that is yeah so as we sort of mentioned before um you know i i regard the the generalized mining space um as kind of the space of opportunities to provide um what chris bernisky calls self supply side services to the centralized networks so um these networks they are if you, if we kind of fast forward into the future if we accept the idea that there's going to be a lot of these diff- networks they're going to be very different they're going to be serving different domains some networks are going to be about um social media other networks about are going to be about decentralized storage other networks are going to be about registering dns uh domain names and so on and so forth if we live in that world then all of those things um all those networks they're not Well, they're not companies right they can't hire uh you know a hardware and IT department they can't hire a compliance department um they have to rely on on the third on all these third parties to provide the services that make them function and many times those services are highly specific um to exactly what those networks need to do if you are uh, a decentralized storage network then you're looking for storage if you're looking if you're live peer then you're looking for people to build gpu center uh you know gpu data centers to um to to transcode video if you're a social network you're looking for highly competent curators of content and maybe those are humans maybe those are bots but the point is that there's all these third parties that have been kind of 
you know, if you will, extracted out of these hierarchical traditional organizations that we have, and now form this cloud uh, that can that can provide service, you know, these kinds of services to to decentralized networks. So the question for us is, you know, how does a crypto fund uh, fit into that uh, scheme? And the way that the way that we kind of think about it is, there's a spectrum of opportunities, and some of those opportunities are very hardware intensive and require relatively low proprietary software. Um, these are things like proof of work mining, right? Here you're building a hundred billion dollar data center and you're competing on your ability to you know, maximize your hash rate. On the other side of the spectrum, you have opportunities that are very software intensive, but, but these software uh, proprietary strategies, you can kind of run on you know, fairly basic and inexpensive uh, hardware, maybe on AWS. And so an example of something like that might be, you know, market making. You have a proprietary algorithm that, that market makes uh, a certain market in, in, in blockchain. Uh, it might be uh, what just happened in the LiveCare network, which is the Merkle mine. The Merkle mine uh, saw a bunch of third party miners uh, just basically distribute 63% of the LiveCare token supply to eligible Ethereum wallets. And those miners are doing that because they're getting a little bit of a reward um, in the token. So it's an interesting uh, crypto economic system. And then if you go into like the middle of that opportunity space, uh, and Meher, you will know a lot about this, um, this might be something like Cosmos. Cosmos is um, you know, not something that you necessarily have to write a lot of proprietary software for because the, the project is kind of giving you the node software. But as you well know, um, you might want to write some. You might want to have kind of increased security in your data center. You might want to have redundancy. You have to worry about uh, maintaining sentry nodes. You have to worry about physical hardware as well, in some sense, um, because you want to increase the physical security. And so this represents kind of a, you know, a staking opportunity, but it's somewhere like in the middle of the spectrum where it's like a little bit of proprietary software, a little bit of, of, of hardware uh, that's certainly more, more expensive than... Um, than what you would get on a totally like, commodified hardware side. And where I think crypto funds fit in, um, they have a natural space in this, in this spectrum, right? If you are looking at the hardware end of the spectrum, well, this is the natural place where proof of work miners are coming in and maybe they're repurposing some of their hardware for these different kinds of networks that are coming in. If you are on the software side of the spectrum, this is the realm of Wants. This is the realm of, uh, you know, smart people who are kind of building models and like trying to, you know, find the best algorithm that, uh, you know, that gets the best content and steam it up to the top. Um, and so I think that's that's the side of, of crypto funds and, and, and quants. And then kind of in the middle, you have this um, the staking uh, sort of area of the spectrum where uh, here you're competing on. How efficient am I? How secure am I? Uh, we've talked to a number of uh, projects at CoinFund at this point uh, whose product is you know, one-click de deployment of staking nodes on, on, on various networks. So this is all about like how fast can you get into this network? How fast can you build stake? How secure are you? Um, and maybe even how many networks can you be on at the same time? So I think, I think crypto funds are going to go to sort of the more proprietary software side. It's sort of very natural. It could, Funds don't want to run hardware data centers if they don't have to. They think they'd probably rather invest in teams that are doing that. Um, and uh, this becomes a, an incredible value add for a fund, I think. And in, 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 in we'll, I think we'll see this in the future. One reason is that you can add tangible, measurable value to your portfolio companies, as we sort of touched upon before, right? Another reason is that you might be this might be a competitive advantage. If you're doing this and you know, other funds are not doing it, then maybe you're generating returns that are not correlated to what most people are doing, which is long-term, long-only investments in, in these like SAFT notes. Um, and in a flat or down market, that might be an interesting source of returns uh, for funds. And finally, I think you have access. You have better access as an investor. And so you know, for us, LivePeer is like a great case study for that. Um, in the sense that we were never early investors in the note. However, when the network came up about a year later, we were able to use um, their mechanisms of transcoding and mining to build up a stake in that network, uh, kind of in a single 
digit percentage uh, size wise, right? Um, in any case, comparable to stakes of, of, of early investors. And we think that's really interesting because it democratizes the ac- access um, you know, to, to ownership of these networks. Now you don't just have to be a VC to get that kind of ownership. You can be a technologically savvy participant. And well, finally, in summary, what that says to me is that I think crypto funds over time are going to have to get a lot more technological. And then VCs who are sort of pure VCs and pure equity investors are going to get a lot more constrained because they can only uh, kind of invest in this one stage of the blockchain company life cycle, which is the stage where you're funding the, 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 early, the early equity. But other folks can choose the stage at which they invest, right? They can invest in that equity, but then they can also um, uh, you know, buy the token on the market. And finally, they can, they can build stakes by direct participation in markets. So we think that this is like a set of features, like it's an amazing opportunity for funds. Cool. Thank you. That was super interesting. Um, so basically, when, when you speak about generalized mining, you mean that um, more people actually actively contribute to the upkeep of the network. Um, so how far do you see that going? Would you expect complete lay people to actually contribute or is it um, a select uh, circle of people contributing? How do you do you have to have some sort of gatekeeping? Um, how do you make sure the people who want to contribute are actually capable of contributing? How do you know their hardware, their software is good enough? I, I think it will vary and it will, you know, again, it will run from highly experienced, very technological companies like Uh, like, for example, the company that Meher is working on, uh, which is providing like very advanced technological services, you know, to just sitting on Steam it as a as a human being and kind of like using your mouse to, to curate articles. But the point is, you know, even if you're a human, like here's an opportunity for you to earn value from the network by contributing a valuable service and that valuable service is curation. Um, so I think, you know, I think there'll be all kinds of players in that, in, in that in that market and they'll all be doing like pretty different things. Some people will be casual, some some organizations will be very serious about a very like narrow area. Um, and then other people might be just concerned with kind of scaling data centers so decentralized storage networks might might flow and work. This sort of brings a different dimension to a crypto fund. Right. Like, so in the beginning, it's like crypto funds are like, oh, I want to invest in the liquid assets that can become the currencies of stores of value in the future. Then like the second generation is, oh, there's going to be these application stacks and I want to invest in that part of the application stack that's going to capture value. And now this almost feels like now coin fund is going to put a new kind of hat in, which is okay, there's this new protocol coming and it's going to need all of these off-chain workers. Can CoinFund build one of those off-chain workers? And if CoinFund does, then is that workers, is, is there a competitive advantage to building that worker that lasts over the long run? And if you do find that there is a competitive advantage to building a worker, then CoinFund would build a sort of a worker node or uh, a generalized mining node. Do you actually think there can be defensible competitive advantages to generalized mining nodes or worker nodes? Like our experience with um, with protocols like LivePeer, Tezos, and even like Bitcoin is that with all of these mining and off-chain services, the market ends up highly competitive because there's free entry anyone can enter and build one of these uh, workers. So there's going to be, there's probably like thousands of miners in Bitcoin. There's already a hundred bakers in Tezos. There's probably going to be, uh, you know, hundreds of transcoders on LifePeer. Do you think there will ever be a protocol in which building a worker makes sense for a crypto fund from a competitiveness and long-term perspective? Yeah, actually, so I have a um, I have a whole range of thoughts about that. But most importantly, <clears throat> is the fact that as the number of networks that need this type of service increases, the networks will always compete for attention from um, you know different staking companies. So a staking company has um, a limited amount of resources, 
you know, both engineering and hardware and uh, cognitive cycles to contribute to every specific project. So all of the staking companies are going to always choose the best ones. And so networks that need this type of service, they will always um, try to create the best incentives. Um, this is a little bit unlike the mining, um, the hardware mining space where the costs, um, the, the profits, the minor profits will always gravitate towards zero because in the staking and generalized mining space, uh, there is a upward push on the, um, on the, on the mining rewards uh, from the networks that compete with each other. Um, so, you know, you as a company can stake Tezos or Cosmos or LifePeer, right? Which one are you going to choose? And, and so there's this natural two-sided competition, one between the staking companies that want to provide the best service and one between the networks that want to get the best staking companies. And so if you are a company as a crypto fund, you get a very natural early entry point to all of these um, um, to all of these opportunities, and and so uh, the competitive advantage for a crypto fund doing this is that the crypto fund is usually aligned with the network from the very beginning and has these dialogues early, and so for us to set up a uh, generalized mining operation for a specific network is very natural. And I think long-term defensibility is a great question, but we don't mind doing generalized mining in the short term. It's always the same discussion as which network do we invest in, which network do we spend time on, and so on. So like the trade-off space for a fund like CoinFund uh, almost appears to be, okay, There's this. There, there are these new networks that are coming up, Either we can build these service nodes or generalized mining nodes ourselves, or we could delegate to other people that are building those nodes, right? And so imagine like there's two, there's two parallel universes, one in which CoinFund adopts the approach, hey, we'll build generalized mining nodes and protocols we love like LifePeer. And there's another parallel universe in which like CoinFund says, hey, we are not going to bother like building these generalized mining nodes let's just delegate right uh, let's just delegate to the to the people that are so in these two universes like coin funds performance over like five or ten years is going to be different mm -hmm. and coin fund is building generalized mining nodes so you have chosen this universe where you do build right what do you think is the long-term advantage to to coin fund given that like generalized mining is so competitive so yeah 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 so so again this goes back to kind of my assertion right that the space of generalized mining opportunities is actually much that much more vast than the space of staking opportunities right so like if you look at um you know most companies in the staking space like alex was kind of getting at are not funds right and so their um their business model kind of depends on their ability to leverage third-party delegation and kind of take a commission on that, um, on that delegation. But of course, that's a limiting factor because not all networks uh, will have opportunities that are staking opportunities and not all staking opportunities will have delegation, right? So at least on, on, on protocol delegation, right? So if you take good for, uh, first example that comes to mind is New Cypher Network, right? New Cypher doesn't, you can actually delegate stake in, in New Cypher, you have to run a node. Um, and so the competitive advantage for a fund, I think, is not so much in competing with the highly commoditized market of staking companies and people who are competing on efficiency. It's more like com competing in the uh, kind of hard to replicate market of proprietary software. And here you're kind of competing on how smart you are and how good of an algorithm you might build. So, so let's take Steemit as my, it's one of my favorite examples here, right? Today, um, there are a bunch of bots on the Steemit network where users basically send them a little bit of Steam and those bots upvote their article and their article goes up higher on the Steam website. And so they earn an ROI in Steam because Steam articles are compensated in Steam by the, by the system. And very, 
you know, in many ways, this is exactly the advertiser model. It's like I go out to Facebook, I pay Facebook some money, Facebook, you know, distributes my, my ads to men over 35 who recently have been divorced, etc. right? And then they buy my product and I get an ROI. In the same way I can pay a Steam bot and get an ROI. Now, which bot is going to give you the best ROI uh, or, or which bot is going to earn sort of like the, the best reward? Well, it's the bot that can most effectively identify indeed what is the correct content. And today, most bots on Steam are really, really stupid. They are like, whoever pays them, they'll just get upvoted. But then eventually, someone is going to come along and they say, I'm going to use a kind of a database and a machine learning algorithm and some other technologies, right, to actually identify and try to predict which Steam posts are going to go viral in the future. And if you can do that on Steam, then you're going to earn a much better return. And because that's a proprietary algorithm, nobody knows how it works because you, you made it up. And so um, you're going to earn a better return than others. And that's, I think that's really the competitive advantage of funds versus kind of going to these more commoditized networks um, or networks in the future might be more commoditized like Cosmos and Tezos and really like anything that has staking. Um, for those kinds of networks, I think, uh, in the long term, funds uh, might be happy to delegate to, to other parties um, who've spent a lot more time on security and efficiency and things like that. But in the in the proprietary software space, I think this is where the really interesting stuff uh, that that's going to certainly get competitive, but not commoditized, uh, is going to happen. Just to follow up on that, a lot of staking uh, tokens today. Um, in effect, if you when you stake them. Um, it's a lot like getting a hidden dividend, right? Um, do, do you think uh, general mining is going to uh, move into that space and take a big cut of that? Or do you think uh, these staking models where, where in effect, you get a hidden dividend um, are a thing that will exist in the future? Well, I, I think, I think uh, generalized mining opportunities, like from staking to proprietary algorithms to kind of hardware mining, like they're all different forms of getting dividends. I think as Alex touched upon, you know, I think in today's world, um, whenever you choose to engage in this activity on a particular network, that is still an investment decision, right? So like, um, like if you look at, you know, staking networks like Tezos Cosmos, you know, you can try to calculate and estimate what is the token denominated return that I might get if I stake a certain amount of, of tokens. Um, and then you might get a number like, I don't know exactly what it is, but Maybe you'll get a number like 10% or like 20%. Um, but I think a lot of the people that are engaging in this activity is not because they want to make 20% return on tokens. It's because they believe they're actually speculating on the success of the network or, or these particular networks and becoming like large multi-billion dollar networks. And what they're really doing is they're speculating on the fiat denominated return but then they're trying to maximize it by also getting that 10% of tokens on, on top, right? So it's kind of funny. Like there's a, there's a number of, uh, for example, like lending platforms in crypto right now where you could put your Ether and then you can earn a little bit of Ether kind of by lending it out, right? But the amount of money that you earn in Ether is like 70 cents, but the volatility of Ether is like thousands of dollars like in your position, right? And so... Um, It, it, a lot of times in today's market, it makes sense to, to still sort of speculate on, this, on the future success of these platforms rather than so much worry about what is the dividend, how much percentage of the dividend am, am I getting? I think that's going to get like uh, to be a lot more important um, you know, down the road when these markets become a little bit more efficient. Um, do I think that who takes a cut of that so i think like like in the commoditized area like when you're when you're talking about specifically staking networks um then as Meher was saying like yeah this gets like really really commoditized and so the 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 companies um that are providing these services are going to be competing on fees and it's always like kind of a race to the bottom i don't think it ever gets to zero um, because these companies have to operate but again whoever can operate the most efficiently can have the lowest sort of fee and then aggregate um, delegation and stake there. Do you have any thoughts on that, Alex? 
Yeah, I think it's hard to um, it's hard to distinguish um, and and classify this space today. I, I don't think of it as necessarily easily separable into you know staking, delegation, generalized mining. You know, it's um, it's very easy to fall into the trap of imagining that you know once you've seen one network, you've seen them all. That's completely untrue. Um, the opportunity to make uh, returns on contribution to various networks um, is is very broad, and so you know um, you can say, well, the funds can just delegate to other stakers, and and you very quickly find out that that's not true. You know, you can say. Um, uh, you know, you can say that uh, staking is is a way to distribute rewards, and then uh, very quickly you find out that that actually requires you to pay a tremendous amount of attention and provide a good service. And so it's not just rewards, but it's rewards for something else. So I would be very careful drawing uh, kind of black and white lines between these areas. Uh, I think of that as uh, providing services to networks according to the rules that they set up. Um, networks are very immature, and and the way that these rules get created is often, um, you know, very quickly uh, becomes clear to be um, not ideal, and the mistakes in that very quickly become obvious, and new networks try to fix them, and so this is very fluid, and like I said, as a fund, we are trying position to position ourselves where we're agile and able to respond to these developments very quickly. Thank you. That was super interesting. Um, so you said that uh, the networks, they're kind of immature. Um, a way that you two are trying to mature them um, is uh, by building, uh, by helping them, uh, by supplying them with a toolkit that you have started building named Adapt. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So. Um, I, I started in blockchain uh, working with projects very early, and um, I very quickly realized um, a, a number of limitations that projects face when using existing technology. So <clears throat> um, let me give you an example. So um, one project I worked with before you know, was trying to create a very advanced financial system, um, and, and they were trying to use Ethereum for that. And, and they very quickly realized that it's very hard for them to create the user experience um, that they want to create for their customers using Ethereum because, you know, Ethereum transactions require paying Ether. And so uh, all the users will, you know, who, who need to transact on their network are going to have to hold their wallet, manage their keys, and hold Ether. Um, and, you know, it... it be came obvious to me that um, in blockchain, uh, and this goes back to our discussion of Fed protocols, to which I have a slightly different answer right now, um, you know, these Fed protocols like Ethereum, uh, EOS, and such, they are in fact designed to capture value. Of course, that's true. You know, the teams have to, you know, ensure that their currency um, has value and has, uh, and that, that value increases. And what that... Uh, almost always means is that their networks will compromise on, on the possible user experience of people who uh, are trying to build and, and use products on top of them. Um, and so I, was start, I started to think about ADAPT um, as a kind of a generalization of blockchain uh, on many levels. Uh, the main premise of that is that even the network on which your application runs has to be customized to your application's use case. Generalized networks um, will inevitably compromise user experience, and the choices that these networks make will inevitably make things more complicated for at least some use cases. Um, to give another example, you know, CryptoKitties was built on Ethereum. Ethereum uh, was, was a network that was built from um, kind of uh, came out of the Bitcoin thinking of sovereignty of money and radical decentralization. But CryptoKitties is a game. They don't need radical decentralization. And, and the moment you realize that, you realize that Ethereum is, is the wrong platform. 
And and so um, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to enable people to experiment and create smaller, much more customized networks um, for their users. Right? Does that make sense? Thank you. That made uh, perfect sense. Um, so what kind of... Uh, Uh, what kind of tools do you actually provide uh, the projects with in this ADAPT framework? So ADAPT is platform technology, but it's not a platform network. And that's a distinction which would have been very easy to make in 2005. But it's very hard to make in 2018 because everybody thinks of networks as platforms. Uh, but if you go back to 2005 and look at, you know, Wiki, GCC, uh, you know, Linux and so on, you kind of quickly understand that platform is software. And so Adapt is software. It's a software to build and launch networks. Uh, and it's modularized software. So it uh, basically is structured as a programming language um, on top of a very general data model that allows you to develop nodes, uh, build consensus algorithms, and then also develop the Uh, smart contract infrastructure on that network and the business logic. Um, and so as a toolkit, it looks like a star where in the middle you have the compiler of the programming language that uh, above that it has modules in that programming language and below that it has the primitives and the data structures and the networking components that can be accessed from that language. Um, and, and the language is basically the glue that makes the toolkit work. Um, so using the toolkit, the idea is that basically you uh, can first um, load and use, you know, all the necessary modules that somebody else has developed for things like wallets, tokens, um, you know, voting, uh, governance, um, you know, TCRs, you know, whatever generalized components that can be built in decentralized space can, can be developed and reused. And then you would add some business logic for your specific project. And then you would launch that as a decentralized network that is specific to your specific project. Very interesting. So to me, like because I'm building a validator, uh, a commodity validator for the Cosmos network, uh, uh, I, I tend to think of ADAPT as... So the vision behind Cosmos was like it allows entrepreneurs to build uh, their own spoke chains, their own blockchains and have those blockchains handle their own application. And like that blockchain is tailored for exactly that application. So, you know, like this vision of application specific blockchains would have, for example, Augur build its own blockchain network, Gnosis build their own blockchain network and so on. And so ADAPT to me is is a very similar vision, but with a different technology stack. But the key difference is one of incentives, right? So in, in Cosmos, they have this token, the Atom, and they, they want to create a platform around the Atom. So when somebody else builds a, builds a blockchain application, some of the value of that blockchain application, they want it to leak into the Atom token, right? And so like Cosmos, the project has like launched this Atom token, And their incentives are geared towards leaking some of the value of these blockchain applications into the Atom token. What's special ad about ADAPT from this perspective is you don't want to create that central Atom token or the central Ethereum token to which the application value should leak into, right? And you want to keep build just like this open source stack that anyone can use to build their blockchain network. Yeah, so at Cosmos, um, to me, is probably one of the best thinking in blockchain. And it's actually, like you say, it's very similar. Um, what Cosmos is doing will naturally happen in ADAPT because you do need a hub. You do need a trading, a trading center. You do need infrastructure services for the entire ecosystem of these small to medium-sized networks, right? Um, the difference, I would say, is not... In, in the value capture process, but more in the amount of freedom and the amount of sort of high level, um, high level tools that developers get when they want to create their own network. So, for example, Cosmos is completely based on 
the Tendermint consensus protocol, which has you know fast finality and some really good properties. However, um, it's not necessarily clear to me that that's what you want for all use cases. Um, Cosmos uh, uses fast finality uh, because they want uh, inter-blockchain communication. They want to move tokens from one uh, um, uh, from one zone to another. Um, I don't think that's correct. I think that's too limiting because in some zones you can implement tokens using uh, different code bases that even don't even exist on the other zone, in the other network, right? So it, it, it's not clear to me that moving tokens from one network to another makes sense. What's clear to me, nevertheless, is that you need, for example, a decentralized exchange to live kind of in the middle of the ecosystem. And, and it's likely that, um, you know, that's, that's where this will go. Um, but I want a lot more freedom in every zone. I want zones to be able to choose their consensus protocol. And, and if they want uh, probabilistic finality, they should have it, right? Um, if they want their um, zones to be not interoperable with the rest of the ecosystem, they should be able to do it. ADAPT is much more high level than, than Golang in terms of um, developing code um, because it's, um, it hides away um, data modeling and it provides high level tools for you know, organizing data and creating secu reusable security primitives uh, inside your database. Um, so I claim that it will be a lot quicker to develop a um, you know, an adapt network than Cosmos Zone if you, if you need, if you want to be sufficiently um, uh, different uh, from, from the rest of it. Thank you. Uh, that was super interesting. Um, so does ADAPT have a business model? Um, we're working on it. At the moment, ADAPT is fundraising on uh, donations because I'm really sick and tired of seeing projects raise billions of dollars on a white paper. And, and I have a very principal objection to that because to me that creates really, really bad incentives that will basically destroy the space in the long term. Uh, but but we are in discussion uh, internally about um, how we can structure this effort because to us it is uh, painfully clear that um, the kind of subtle shift in perspective that I'm offering um, that, that, that we are sort of trying to put together is really important for this space. We want to do this as a fund because we are also tired of projects coming to us and, and painting an unrealistic picture of how their adoption and how their base layer technology, you know, will work because we've seen so much uh, in this space and we've thought about it for so long in terms of real world use cases and real world adoption that we can very quickly point out what will be a blocker for these projects. And that's what we're trying to solve. We're trying to create a mechanism for people to uh, build, build the next generation of blockchain technology where each application can be customized and their network and their, you can say protocol, but it's an overused word, will be customized to their users to an extent where it will stop being a toy and will become a real world tool. So think about questions such as governance, recourse, uh, validator incentives, uh, transaction economics. Can your, you know, can your um, social networking application built on Ethereum today have free transactions? You know, can your miners of your network also be your um, oracles, also be your, uh, you know, service providers on many different levels to your application? The answer is, you know, life peer is running on Ethereum. Um, Ethereum has miners, but LifePeer has to enlist a whole new group of people to help them with their, their Merkle mine share draw. Ideally, those would be the same people. This feeds directly into our discussion on generalized mining because, you know, and this takes me to the topic of initial witness offerings, where it's very explicit that early supporters and investors in this project, in, in, in a project, should also be service providers and the miners 
that are highly aligned with the mission of the project. We don't have that today. We don't have that level of alignment between early supporters and, and later service providers. And that's what I'm trying to create because to me that's more important for, for the long term of, of this ecosystem. Cool. Uh, Alex, we really look forward to seeing the development of the ADAPT project. Perhaps we should have an episode on the ADAPT project when, you know, uh, when part of the protocol is released and the first application blockchain network start, start building on it. So that brings us to the end of uh, the show. Alex and um, Alexander and Jake, thanks for, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Meher, for your guys. So happy to be here. Thank you, Meher. Cool. Thank you, um, Frederica. So thank you for all that listened to this episode. Um, as you know, like we release episodes of Epicenter every Tuesday or Wednesday. So subscribe to us if you if you like the content. You can also watch a video version on the of the show on youtube.com slash epicenter bitcoin. And you can chat with all of the hosts and the community members at epicenter.tv slash getter. Uh, if you like the this recording or you didn't like it, leave us an iTunes review as it helps people find the show and it makes us happy. And we look forward to being back next week. Thank you.